The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. In 1978, the first so-called test tube baby was born. The new technology sparked debates about the role of science in the creation of human life. Today, most Americans consider the technique, known as in vitro fertilization, to be just another fertility treatment. But advances in biotechnology have sparked a new controversy, embryonic stem cell research. Supporters of the technique claim that it could cure many debilitating diseases, but some critics believe it devalues human life by treating potential human embryos as a natural resource. Do the potential medical benefits of stem cell research outweigh the social and ethical implications? What makes it different from in vitro fertilization? And is science moving too fast for society? To find out, we're joined this week by Leon Cass, Chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics and author of Beyond Therapy, Biotechnology and the Pursuit of Happiness. And now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besherov. Leon, welcome to Policy Watch. Nice to be with you, Doug. Well, besides being a medical doctor, Leon, you have a PhD in biochemistry. Yes. And you've done biochemistry. I did research uh, after graduate school. I did research at the NIH uh, in the late 1960s before making this uh, transition to a new life. Did work on molecular biology and bacteria, uh, things earlier than that on, on, on fat metabolism. One of the interesting conceptual things that in fact came out of my own research, uh, we developed uh, an inhibitor of one of these enzymes that made fatty acids in bacteria. Um, and we thought that if you could add this inhibitor to the growing bacteria, you might stop them dead in their tracks, and that this was, would be a kind of rational approach to the design of antibiotics. You find an essential protein in the bacterium that you work with outside the cell, you find some way to inhibit that protein, and then you feed that inhibitor to the living bacteria. And it turned out that uh, in, a, in a paper that I published, I think about 1970, um, this, uh, this actually worked in bacteria. The trouble was that um, it, uh, it was a little too active when it got into the body, so it didn't pan out. But the proof of concept has now really taken off, and the design of these kinds of rational antibiotics, beginning with enzymology, is now very much in vogue. Um, as a layperson, I, as, as I hear scientists like you talk about this, I'm just in awe. Uh, when I was in school, the cell was the cell. No one was going in it and so forth. And, and now as I read your writings and others, uh, it's simply awesome what modern science can do at such a s micro level. No, I mean, it's, uh, in fact, I, I would have a great deal of trouble, I think, simply going back uh, and understanding the latest reports in the research seminars in the place where not that, or not all that long ago, I was myself an active researcher. The, uh, the discoveries are astonishing in genetics, in developmental biology and embryology. We stand on the threshold of what might be the greatest scientific uh, a revolution of them all, the understanding of the nervous system and the brain. Uh, we know very little about it, but this is, I think, the century of neuroscience and the brain. Um, and simply from the point of view of understanding how living systems work uh, uh, and ultimately of using that knowledge for the cure of disease and the relief of suffering, um, the, the promise is enormous. And it's a very, very exciting time to be a biologist and to be a physician. Um, uh, with small asterisks, we should be very careful that we not allow the promises to outpace what we are able to do. And I'm afraid that to some extent that's been done in the stem cell field. We can probably talk about that. We will, but first let's, so now you are 
president chair of the president's council on bioethics so that must feed directly from these dramatic developments what is the council and what do you charge to do the the council is uh, 18 uh, <coughs> individuals appointed by the president <coughs> excuse me we are in our our second term the uh, the members come from all across the fields of academic life uh, and we have an unbelievably broad charge. Although we were created in connection with the president's stem cell decision and charged with monitoring stem cell research, its progress uh, and the various public debates that surrounded it, the charge that was given to us was really quite monumental. We are to advise, we're responsible to the president and are supposed to advise him on bioethical matters. But if you looked at the specific Subcharges. The first is to conduct fundamental inquiry into the human significance of advances in biomedical science and technology. In other words, to talk about these new developments, present and projected, and try to say what do they mean actually for human beings uh, living now and living soon. Second, to. Uh, and let me interrupt it. And that means in part trying to decide what it means to be human, doesn't it? Well, I think that's, that's what um, I've known for a long time and what I'm, I'm happy to say the Council in its publications has been able to do, to uh, call attention not just to the pitched battles as they appear in public between uh, 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 those who think stem cell research is good and those who think killing embryos is too high a price to pay for it, but to step back and say, what, what do all of these developments somehow add up to insofar as they are all part of a growing power to intervene into the human body and into the human mind in ways that could, in fact, affect what it means to be a human being. And it is to um, make those larger questions much more visible in the public uh, 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 consciousness and in the minds of legislators and other policymakers that we have really devoted a lot of our attention. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Please. But you were going through the charge to the right. council. The, the second is um, to uh, conduct uh, inquiry into the... Uh, the, the ethical problems, specifically ethical problems that are raised by biomedical science and, and technology, uh, to advise on the policy issues, to serve as a forum for national discussion of these questions, to contribute to public education, and then finally an area that we've not been able to do anything in, to look for areas of possible international cooperation because these, these developments are not simply one nation's business. So that's a very tall order, and the biotechnical areas uh, that we're, uh, among others, uh, sort of suggested that we pay attention to are, are not only the technologies of reproduction and the beginning of life, but uh, organ transplantation, neuroscience, computer, uh, uh, me mechanical human interactions, uh, and questions around the end of life. So the full range of biotechnical developments. Well, we'll get to many of them, but let me pick up on one thing you mentioned. The council was created after the president's initial decision about stem cell research? Yeah, it, he announced when he made that decision that he would create the council. And over the course, that was August 2001, in the course of the next four or five months, he recruited uh, people. We met our, had our first meeting in January of 2002. It probably bears repeating, what is the president's policy? What is the current U.S. policy on the subject? Well, there, there are two pieces of the U.S. policy. Uh, one generally not much n noticed is there's actually legislation on the subject. Um, Congress has every year since 1995 um, uh, passed an amendment to the Appropriations Bill, the Dickey uh, Amendment, which says Federal money may not be spent on any research in which human embryos are harmed or destroyed. And that's, that's not uh, executive policy, that's, that's statute. Um, and the question is what within that kind of legislation uh, can the federal government do to support not so much embryo research but research on cells that originally came from embryos. So uh, the president sort of agonized over this question. On the one hand, he wanted to support stem cell research, research on embryonic stem cells that had been derived from embryos, the embryos themselves no longer being alive. 
we should tell people why do we want these okay let's start from there uh, what are stem cells uh, stem cells are these primordial cells which uh, give rise with d appropriate signals to all of the more specialized and differentiated cells of the body. Uh, an embryo starts out as a single cell, it divides to two. When it gets to be about a hundred, it forms a little spherical ball of cells. The outer part becomes the contribution to the placenta inside of what they call the inner cell mass. The inner cell mass becomes you and me. And if you take those, if you destroy the embryo, take out the inner cell mass and get lucky, some of those inner cell mass cells will start to divide in the laboratory and culture. They become what you call stem cells. They can keep on dividing as themselves indefinitely. And if you trigger them with appropriate signals, you can get them to turn into liver cells or heart muscle cells or nerve cells. And we can do that today. That we can do. How do we trigger them? How we trigger them? We uh, isolate various kinds of factors that, since the genes in all of them are the same, I mean, the difference between a liver cell and a brain cell is not a matter of genes. All, the, all of the cells of the body have exactly the same genes, the same DNA. The question of which ones of them are on and which ones of them are off in the different places. So it's a question of providing the right kind of signals to turn on those genes that make neurons and shut off those genes that would make a liver cell. And the scientists are learning now how to control these cells through the appropriate signals derived from the tissues of, of, of more specialized uh, organs. So the great promise is uh, the, the interest in stem cells is really twofold. And by the way, one should say, and we might come back to this, it was originally thought that apart from stem cells that are found in the bone marrow of adults, um, that the only interesting stem cells would be from embryos because the stem cells in the embryos give rise to everything. We, you and I started out as one cell. Eventually those 50 to 60 cells began to grow and divide and become different kinds of things. But one of the astonishing things of the last half dozen years has been the discovery of stem cells in just about every organ in the body, so-called adult stem cells, although you find them in children as well. And it turns out that a liver stem cell can actually be coaxed into making other than liver cells. And it may very well turn out that we will be able to do just about as much as we can. We may be able to do as much with cells derived from adults and from children as we can now think of doing with embryonic stem cells. And, and, and this is the great hope of people that, that, who don't want the... Yeah, the, this, and this would be a way of doing something in an absolutely un ethically uncontroversial way. But, but the controversial way is? The controversial way is you can't get embryonic stem cells without destroying embryos, embryos at the roughly five to six day stage. And how do we get the embryo? How do you get the embryos? Well, um, basically three ways. Uh, for the most part, they've been gotten from so-called spare embryos in the in vitro fertilization clinics. Uh, one story leads to the next. The assisted reproduction clinics when people come seeking remedies for infertility, uh, hormones are given to the woman. She uh, produces many more eggs in one cycle than she normally would, up to 20 eggs. These eggs are harvested. They're fertilized, uh, ideally with the husband's sperm. Some of these fertilized eggs grow up. You get uh, uh, three or four or five little embryos that look pretty good. They get transferred to start with a pregnancy. Others are frozen. The ones that are frozen, by the way, you know, I used to do family law. The ones that are frozen, of course, are people in being. They, they are, no, exactly. And there's a question of to whom do they belong and what happens if the couple who had created them no longer wants them and whose are they if there's a divorce and there are as many law cases as you want already on, already, on, these, on, this, already on the, these things. Because as those of us who don't pay close attention, um, although there are failure rates, these, the, these embryos are ready to be implanted and to make a baby. Right. Um, some of them uh, are no longer wanted for the reproductive purpose for which they were created. And with consent, they have been given, in some cases, to scientists who then grow them a little further and then get the stem cells from them 
in the process, of course, disaggregating and destroying the embryo. So the so-called spare embryos that you hear about, the ones that are still capable of being a child if implanted, in some, you know, if they're successful, are, are no longer wanted, hence regarded as spare, hence uh, if they're going to die anyhow, the argument goes, why not allow them to be used for research? Other embryos have been created specially for purposes of research, uh, not for reproductive purpose, but uh, creating life simply for experimental purposes. The president in the recent State of the Union address uh, said that he was in fact opposed to creating life solely for experimental purposes, got a standing ovation in fact on both sides of the aisle, so that was a kind of interesting development. The third way of creating embryos for research is not by the union of egg and sperm, but by cloning embryos, and we might want to talk about that as well. Uh, but uh, I mean, the, the stem cells were discovered, as you say, in 1998, uh, not even seven years. Uh, the excitement is enormous because it really does open up the possibility first of all, of learning about the process of differentiation and development. If you really have an isolated cell and you could learn how it develops into a nerve cell or how it develops into a heart muscle cell, even if you never put those things back into the body, you might be able to learn something that would help keep normal tissue healthier or to trigger partially diseased tissue in the body to remain fit. But the second and, the, and the, the, the aspect of this that has been touted, I think, to the point of hype is that you have a full regenerative medicine in which these stem cells, for the easiest case would be to take either diabetes or to take a heart disease. You take the stem cells in the laboratory, you teach them how to become insulin producing pancreatic cells, and then you put them into somebody and they, the child, uh, the juvenile diabetic would, in the ideal case, no longer need insulin by injection, but the body would make its own insulin. Now, one of course has to find a way not to reject this tissue because it's foreign tissue and, and transplanted. Um, but th the whole idea of regenerative medicine is that you have these spare tissues and spare parts and ultimately perhaps even spare organs that could be grown to order um, and put in to replace what has been either diseased or injured. You mentioned hype, and I think we all can remember um, the last political campaign and TV commercials before that with Christopher Reeves. Um, realistically, how close, how far away are we from some of these things? Well, uh, Doug, I remember I remember the arguments in the 1970s about fetal research uh, and how getting tissues from aborted fetuses were in fact going to produce exactly this kind of regenerative medicine. Um, and uh, friends of mine who have been in wheelchairs for a couple of decades have sat through that period of time and uh, are now somewhat more cautious, some of them, about uh, these new promises. Um, Alzheimer's disease, which was uh, taken advantage of in the Democratic Convention with Ron Reagan Jr. speaking about this, that's the one disease, I think, for which almost all researchers say stem cell is not the answer. There's very exciting research on Alzheimer's disease, possibly a vaccine against the proteins which gets put down and they get put down in there and produce the jumble and tangle. Um, uh, spinal cord injury, promising. Juvenile diabetes, promising. Uh, Parkinson's disease, promising. But how soon? Um, I think the most careful and responsible researchers, and I'm talking about people who are enthusiastic about this, will tell you privately it will be decades. It will be decades before this pans out. And uh, John Gerhardt, who has one of the co-discoverers of embryonic stem cells at Johns Hopkins, who has a large institute, says that he doubts if there's anybody now alive who's going to have their disease cured. And that's a very sobering and important thought. It's very cruel to exploit the hopes of now suffering people and their families with a promise that if you just change the administration, the cure is going to be right around the corner. It's, a, it's, 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 uh, it's very painful for me to watch. And the opposition to this kind of stem cell 
harvesting is because of um, feelings about what the embryo is or is not? Yeah, I think, um, I think the strong pro-life position, uh, and I think this is probably the president's position and certainly the position of this amendment in Congress. We never did finish the president's policy, but we can, we can sort of work that in here. Um, uh, that um, a human life is a human life from the beginning. Uh, these people regard uh, even a fertilized egg uh, and everything thereafter not as potential human life, but as a human life with potential. That it is what a human being looks like at that stage of development. And the destruction of human life, even if good may come of it, is something that they do not countenance. Uh, other people are concerned about, uh, even people who are somewhat agnostic about whether the embryo is the equivalent of a child, and I'm quite frankly one of those. I don't regard the beginning human embryo as the equivalent of a child, but I don't have confidence that I'm right about that. So I'm, I'm somewhat agnostic on how to regard the early even those people begin to get nervous about what it means to take the earliest stages of human life created for reproductive purposes and come to regard it as a kind of natural resource for exploitation and use. Um, and what does it mean for us as a society if we come increasingly to regard that as an appropriate practice? But I, And yet, then, what you're saying suggests that if you if you think about the argument about abortion and pro-life, there are a substantial percentage of Americans who are prepared to say abortion under any condition. Right. So this ends up being a situation in which people's underlying um, values, attitudes, religious beliefs, whatever. Well, um, it, it's, it's true that there is an overlap with the abortion issue, but it's important to see how this is different. In the abortion controversy, the abortion situation, what you have, uh, to describe it neutrally, is whatever claim you can make on behalf of nascent human life growing already in the, in, in the woman's uterus, and the rights and interests of the woman herself or of the woman and her, and her partner, right? And uh, the argument has been uh, pro-life and pro-choice, uh, choice of the woman. In the case of, of embryos sitting in the laboratory, the woman's interest isn't there. You don't have a concrete person who's carrying a child that they do not want to weigh over against whatever claims the, the, uh, the, the child to be. But uh, we do have the, the future. We, we, have, um, we have the unnamed patients. possible future people. We have them. But, it, it, but and, uh, though the benefits are certainly for the time being speculative, and the people will say, look, you've got alternative, morally unproblematic ways to try to get the same thing done. Well, that's why the adult stem that's why this cells other, are so important. That, that's, why that's, that's why that argument goes that way. But um, so that the, in a way, there's an overlap between the people on abortion and the people on stem cell research, but not strictly. I mean, there are some some feminist groups very strong on uh, abortion rights who are very leery of uh, starting down the road of manipulating embryos. Some of the um, uh, sort of environmental groups and the people hostile to genetic engineering don't want us to start down manipulating embryos. Today it's just for stem cells. Tomorrow it might be genetic modification. And so there are new alliances here uh, because people recognize that this is not exactly the abortion question. It's related, but somewhat different. But it almost seems to me as if it's inevitable um, that this research will continue. The ban is a federal ban on additional. The, the, the ban is not a federal ban. It's a, it's, it, this has been misrepresented. But no, 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 I know, I know. It's a ban on funding. Funding. Just funding. Funding, right. R research is legal in the United and, States. And California has just committed a few billion dollars. New Jersey's right. about to do it. Right. You know, there may be a race of other states. Right. So, this is going to happen now all over the country. Oh, I think, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the, the, the argument has now moved very much to the states. Some states have banned all kinds of embryo research, period. Six of them have bans on all cloning, including cloning for research. California has led the way of the sort of high uh, biotech states, which will follow suit. Um, 
the people in California are actually, some of them, quite nervous because now that the money is there, they're actually going to have to make good on this promise. Uh, and because the stuff has been hyped, and if they don't deliver in the course of the next half a dozen years, the citizens of California are going to be wondering, have we really invested our money well for the treatment of the very same diseases? After all, there are other means of trying to fight these sorts of things. But um, look, the funding matter is, is the funding matter um, is, has a different kind of importance. It's not just the resources to go forward. It's the national imprimatur that a certain kind of practice is approved by the nation as a whole. And there are some members of my council who are in favor of stem cell research, who don't mind the destruction of embryos, but who nevertheless support a ban on federal funding because there is a sizable minority of the people in the country who do not want federal approval, the nation's blessings, to be pronounced on this. And that's a very interesting political question for and, us. And, and the resolution with the states may have dealt with it. May have dealt with it. Well, on that note, let me again thank Leon Cass for being here at Policy Watch in the University of Maryland. Leon Cass, Chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics, thank you again for being with us. Thanks a lot. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.